The ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we are back with another one. It is the Authority Project. I am Brian S. Arnold here, and I am here with my new good friend here, Lloyd Yip. And he says he's going to help us build an appointment setting team, which he says is the key to scaling high ticket offers into seven figures. Is that right, Lloyd? That is correct. And I'm super stoked to share it with everyone today, all the tips and tricks about how you can do exactly that. Awesome. Well, we shall see. We shall see what it can do for us today on this amazing episode of The Authority Project. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, feast your eyes and tune your ears. It's that time again. We are live with another episode of The Authority Project. It's the video podcast streamed on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Periscope, where we talk to digital marketers, business coaches, and creators of all kinds on how they've built authority in their field and how you can mimic their success. Developing authority, building your audience, and attracting better clients to your own business. Now, without further ado, let's bring to the virtual stage your host, Brian S. Arnold. All right, and we are back with another one, folks. It is Brian S. Arnold here. This is the Authority Project, and you are the project. We want to slap authority to your name so you can sell more of what you're great at. And I am honored to have in the virtual stage, Mr. Lloyd Yip, Yip there. Mr. Lloyd Yip, how are you doing today? Doing great. Doing great. How are you doing? How are you doing? I, I am doing fabulous today. So we're, we're going to dive right into it. Yeah, and get into this into this topic here. But actually, before we do that, let's start first of all. Lloyd, tell us who you are personally, and then professionally. Yeah, yeah. So personally, um, I'm a Canadian. I had spent my early years in my career working at software companies, actually. And the thing is, Working in a software company, you learn a lot of cool skills. You learn a lot of technology. You learn a lot of automation. You learn a lot of skills which really translate well into building a business. But despite being in the software world for five or six years, I had always felt like, man, I- I'm slipping behind my friends. For whatever reason, a lot of my friends in college had went on to build their own companies. And here I was. I had all the skills of how to build a company, technology skills, sales skills, marketing skills, yet I was not doing it. So when I was around 26 years old, I finally decided, you know what, let's go on and just try to branch off my own. I wanted to travel more. I wanted to have a bit more of a remote lifestyle where I could have control, uh, complete freedom over what it was that I was doing and where I was working and who I was working with. And luckily for me, those skills that I had learned in the early years of my career really did translate well. And part of that skill set actually was that I was in sales, that I had been tasked with developing sales teams and learning how to do business development at a high, uh, at a larger scale for these companies selling expensive offers. And naturally, the the type of business that made the most sense, given my skill set, was, hey, maybe I should go and start coaching and consulting other companies on how they could build sales teams, how they could leverage social media and. Uh, organic marketing to generate more clientele. And it's been around two years since I started that company. Um, Things have been going pretty spectacularly, despite, you know, some of the craziness that's happened in the last year. And um, I I think especially now more than ever, people really want to learn how they can apply technology. It is 2021 after all. And the beautiful thing about business today is that it's easier to scale than businesses from 20 years ago, even 10 years ago. There's so many more tools and tech and different strategies at our disposal. But with that, sometimes comes with a lot of overwhelm. With that, sometimes comes with almost too much information that it makes it hard for different business owners to process. And that's what I want to bring. I want to bring a way of simplifying some of the core fundamental strategies so that even someone who doesn't have years and years and years experience building teams or leveraging technology so that they can still apply it in their own businesses as well. Awesome. I like that. Great stuff. Great stuff. So you can, can you tell us anything, anything more about you personally? What do you, what do you do? Per, who is, who is Lloyd Yip, the personal guy? Who, who yeah. Are you? Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's kind of funny. Like I was mentioning before about how I was envious of my friends and the reason why wasn't because they were necessarily making a ton of money. It was because while they were building their businesses, they were traveling. They had built very remote organizations and they were able to 
take like a year or two and live in Colombia while building or go to Europe and live there for the summer. And that was always something that I had really wanted to do. So right now I'm actually calling you uh, from Mexico. I've been here for the last two weeks. Before that, I was spending um, time in Brazil. I was there for seven months. And being here, it's cool. You get to enjoy more sun. I'm now pretty decent at Portuguese. I'm learning Spanish. I'm conversational in that. Um, I'm able to do a lot of things here in terms of you know learning new skills, hobbies, um, enjoying culinary experiences that I might not be able to enjoy in Canada. So that was always like a pretty big uh, you know motivator for me to build a business, and it's it's ultimately allowed me to live a lifestyle, which I think is a lot more aligned with what I want compared to the type of lifestyle that I was living in Toronto, where it was just like a lot of commuting and dealing with like the big city and needing to be inside for five months of the year because of the winter. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's dive right into this topic then. So yeah. how, how do we get to building an appointment setting team so we can scale it to seven figures? Yeah, so I do want to preface that not everyone should try to build an appointment setting team. It's it's a pretty advanced strategy. And if you're just starting out or if you're kind of early days in your business, it's going to be hard. Building a sales team, building an appointment setting team does require capital. It does require that you've already tested and validated your offers and the market likes it. Like there's certain prerequisites that you need to have. But the reason why eventually building an appointment setting team is important is because it's a much more scalable strategy than for the CEO or the founder to continue doing everything themselves, right? There's really, there's really two different types of entrepreneurs that I've met over um, the last couple of years in our uh, space, selling the high, like high ticket online offers. The first, um, the first bucket is the entrepreneur that's just built a huge social following organically. Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, whatever, you name it, right? And that type of, uh, that type of um, entrepreneur, yes, they're going to be able to get clients just because their content is good. After all, a lot of people who enjoy your content, they're just going to try to find some calendar link to book a call with you, or they're just going to try to find some purchase link for one of your offers, and they're just going to buy from you. But yeah. inherently, what a lot of founders eventually recognize is that most buyers are very complacent. Most people are what I would consider as um, passive content consumers or lurkers, where they're more than... <laughs> they're more than now, lurkers, I understand, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so passive content consumers, lurkers, that's all good. It's just semantics, right? But essentially, these people are more than happy to just engage or consume your videos, your blog posts, whatever it may be, but they usually don't do anything with it. They don't usually take action. And highly efficient businesses are not going to rest on their laurels and expect or assume that these prospects are just going to go and reach out to you. Um, a lot of organizations that do well are willing to go and tap on the shoulder of that particular prospect, right? Maybe someone has been in your email list for a while, but instead of waiting for them, you just go to them and say, hello on LinkedIn. Maybe someone's following you, but instead of waiting for them to click on your links, you just literally DM them and be like, Hey, what's up? What's your problems? Let's book a meeting if there's an alignment. And that's really how I scaled the early days of my business where I had built an organic following through content. And I was actively talking to all of them, whether it be picking up the phone or just straight up DMing them to have a bit of a conversation for me, like for every one meeting that I was able to book from just someone finding like a webinar link and booking themselves, I was like generating three or four meetings by proactively hitting them up. Mm -hmm. And a lot of other entrepreneurs have realized this, right? That's why DMs and instant messaging and proactive reach outs are so big. But the problem is that this doesn't scale. The problem is that an entrepreneur that does this all day by themselves is going to spend hours and hours a day DMing and trying to book meetings if they've built that audience. And inevitably you kind of just like break down because there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah. Yeah. Burnout. Burnout. <laughs> That's literally what happened to me yeah. before yeah. I had moved to Mexico. Um, I couldn't because in Toronto I was working 60, 65 hours a week. And half of that time was me just like talking on email or on LinkedIn or on Facebook with clients trying to book appointments. And eventually I, I needed to even go to physiotherapy because I was 
craning my desk downwards and looking right. at my laptop for too long in the day. And, and that was super unideal. That was actually one of the reasons why I had really needed to hire some help. And this is, this is probably the first, uh, uh, the first um, archetype of entrepreneur who's hit a certain level of success, but they're starting to bottleneck because of um, the appointment setting a constraint, right? That's, that's the first version of entrepreneur that I've seen a lot of. But there's a second entrepreneur that I want to talk about as well. And the second entrepreneur is more likely to use paid ads, right? Maybe they were never super stoked about the idea of building an organic following. They're like, oh man, building an Instagram presence seems like a lot of work. Uh, building a LinkedIn following, building a Facebook group, it's a lot of work, right? So instead, they just opt to drive a lot of paid traffic. But what they realize eventually, especially these days where compliance is getting harder, ad accounts are getting banned, you have um, Apple making these new rules, which inherently make it harder to be profitable with ads. They start realizing like, whoa, ads are getting very expensive and I don't know how to make this profitable the way that it might have been in 2017 or 2018. Yeah. And what I've realized because last year I started running ads and I had the same problem. Like my ad account got banned and then I got it back. And then I was like working with like a one to a 1.5 return on ad spend, which is not good. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, what is going on? How do I fix this? How do I make this as effective as my organic strategy, which was primarily utilizing my appointment setters. Mm -hmm. And what I had realized was, oh, sh oh, oh, shoot. Like what if I applied those same appointment setters, but just had them hit up the leads that I generated from paid traffic? What if instead of letting these people that I converted from paid traffic, just go through my email campaign and see a webinar. And that's, and I was just hoping that that content would get them to book a meeting. What if instead of waiting, I just reached out to them and for sure, this is not something that you can do without an appointment setting team. There's no way because there's too many leads, right? If you spend a thousand dollars, $2,000, $10,000 per month on ad spend, there's too many opt-ins, but yeah. If you have an appointment setting team and you're able to literally reach out to every single opt-in <laughs> and instead of waiting for them to just self select a meeting booking, you literally just talk to them. And sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no, but having that appointment setter do the grunt of the work, you can literally take that same exact number of opt-ins that you would have gotten from that same exact number of paid traffic spend, but you would double or triple the amount of meetings that you book just because you're following up with them. Right. And that's what I realized when I started utilizing paid traffic and my ROAS wasn't good. And I just applied the same appointment setting team that I had with my Facebook group, my Instagram following, my LinkedIn following, and just said, Hey, why don't you just talk to my paid traffic people as well and see if you can improve my ROAS there. And this, this was like so baffling to me that no one else <laughs> did this like because everyone just assumes, oh, you know what? Yeah. Let's spend some money on paid traffic. Someone sees a w webinar or a VSL and they'll just like click a link to book a meeting. It's right. just like it isn't that way anymore. Okay. The world's gotten harder. There's more competition. And we really wanted to maximize the dollar value coming out of each and every single lead that we work so hard to generate, whether it be organic or whether it be paid marketing. And that's when we realized, you know what? Appointment setting, this is the key to long-term scale because this is how you can really maximize the value of each lead so this is this is where i come in and i ask the question does it get really like salesy you know when you're when you're having these people when you have these people do this to what you call the lurkers and is it is there a way to for those people who who are you you're hiring i guess to to do this to represent the client in a certain way. Cause I have, I have a thing about, about the salespeople being, having being customer service savvy at the same time. Cause I, cause I here's, here's an example, somebody, somebody from, um, I got, I, I picked up some, some, some kind of lead magnet the other day and he called me, but it was like, it was Saturday night at seven 30 and he called me twice. And that was annoying, <laughs> you, know, you know? So it's just like, do you have, is there any when people are setting up this process? Because obviously this this is a great a great a great vehicle. But when they're setting up this process, is there a way that you're vetting these people to represent the people you know, the clientele that you're getting so that they're they're really really representing what that client is all about? 
Yeah, for sure. So we have an entire process internally to make sure that if we were to bring on a salesperson, that they can speak in our voice. We have a very rigorous training process for sure um, to make sure that when they are talking to people, that they're not just trying to pitch, right? And here's the thing. You don't want to pitch everyone because a lot of the people in your lead list, whether you generated that lead list on social media or via paid traffic, like a percentage of them are probably never going to buy, nor are they even a good fit. So to me, a great salesperson doesn't pitch until they validated that a particular prospect is even in your range of acceptable clients, of acceptable buyers. Like those people that they're talking to have to have the pains first. So whether our setters are operating on the phone or in the DMs of a social media platform, before they ever pitch, we usually train them to first build rapport and trust, right? Have a bit of a back and forth and banter so that people let their defenses down. But then also ask a couple of questions to see if they are actually dealing with some of the problems that we can solve. If, if our setter was to go and talk to someone and ask like, Hey, like, how's your sales team doing? Or do you have a sales team? Or like, are you leveraging, um, you know, social media or paid traffic to grow? If someone says like, Nope, we don't really uh, have a sales team. Um, nope, we're not really trying to grow. Nope. Like, so if they just like, give us all these answers, which would essentially disqualify them. Yeah. Our, our team is not going to try to book a meeting with them. Okay. That would make no sense. <laughs> right. Right? right. But imagine if someone says, yeah, like our sales team isn't really booking any meetings right now, or like, yeah, our, our paid traffic is really expensive and we don't really know how to, you know, make it more uh, cost effective. We don't know how to make it more profitable or yeah, like we've got this like big following on social media, on Instagram and Facebook. And yet for whatever reason, like they engage, but we can't get them to actually book a phone call with us. Then, okay, we're, we have our foot in the door. They have right. a pain point that we can for sure solve. And then our setter is smart enough to be like, Hey, you know what? Like, have you tried doing X, Y, and Z? Maybe we should talk about this on the phone. We, we think that we actually might have the solution to your problem. So gone are the days where you can just literally send a message and have that message be like, Hey, here's exactly what you do. Book a phone call with us. Like, no, now it's more of a conversational marketing where you want to actually have a bit of a back and forth dialogue to understand, is there a fit? And if there is, yeah, suggest the meeting. And in that case, it's a win-win because both yeah. parties would benefit from that meeting. Um, and, and that's a nice thing. Like a salesperson is smart enough to have that type of conversation if they're not a good salesperson and they're just pitching, then that isn't as much of a problem with them as it is about the, their boss who was <laughs> giving them the instructions of just spamming people and calling them at midnight and pitching yeah. regardless yes. of it. Like that's, <laughs> right, that's, the, right. that's a problem with a salesperson, but that's more a problem with the person who manages a salesperson yeah. and shame on them <laughs> right, right. For, for doing that. <laughs> Cause right. it's not a good experience for literally anyone. And it doesn't lead to conversions either. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, how does how does one go about starting this process? Say say we have the scenario they have they have a um a good offer they're they, they're have some sales they they're trying to get out of burnout you know they're trying to you know maximize or or scale what they already have all right they're in that process they're in, they're in that they're in that space how do they go about getting into this process because it seems it seems like it might be a little take a little while for it to get going. So, mm -hmm. can you explain like the process of, of of transferring, transferring you know, their particular systems onto you and onto you or someone else's in the in this in this um, particular process? Yeah, that's a really good question. And interestingly enough, like the process starts before you even try to start hiring, because one of the mistakes that I've seen a lot of people make. And this isn't just for a hiring appointment status, by the way. This is literally when anyone hires any type of team member or any type of employee where you hire someone and then when they are joining the team and they ask, okay, so what do you want me to do? The boss just goes like, I, I don't know, go figure it out. And this, this happens way too often where employees come in and the, the manager doesn't even have a definitive plan for what they should be doing. And even if you hired like the best, most talented person ever, if you don't put them in a, in a position to succeed and you're just like expecting that they'll go figure it out, they're going to fail probably. So before you even think about hiring, you got to build 
a process internally of what that person is going to do when they are hired, right? What does their day to day look like? What are the things that define success for them? Like how many meetings should they be booking per day, for instance? Like, how, do you have a tracking sheet and technology ready to go for them on their first day so that they can be successful? Do you have internally all the instructions for them to go and execute the tasks that they need to execute? That needs to be built before you hire them so that when they are brought on, they can immediately hit the ground running and you can literally just give them like a booklet of, all right, do these things and you'll be successful, meaning you're going to make money. So that's the first thing. I always tell my clients that if you build this, then once that person is hired, you can actually take a bit of a step back and not even worry too much because you know that as long as you hire the right person yeah. and you give them such a good process that they're just going to follow the process and you'll be fine. And then you can just focus as a CEO or as a manager on things that matter more rather than babysitting people all the time and <laughs> making sure that they're doing the right thing right? Which yeah, is inevitably yeah. what happens if you haven't right. given them the instructions in advance, right? right. Exactly. So yeah. that's the first thing. Um, but let's assume that you have this. Let's assume you have those systems built out. Even right. if it's not perfect, you have something, right? And you have the capital to uh, afford it. And you have like the top of the funnel traffic where your setters can go and start prospecting out of. Let's assume you have all that. The next thing is Okay, let's let's actually try to source some candidates. Let's try to hire some candidates. So with this, there's actually a lot of different avenues. For me, I still do prefer hiring out of my network first. I think a lot of people generally say that um, when it comes to most types of hires, right? If, if, if your network of entrepreneur friends have recommendations for who they can vouch for, it usually is going to be a higher quality of person than just trying to source cold. But let's say you don't have a huge network, which yeah. frankly, a lot of people don't. Um, the nice thing is that there's actually a lot of different other channels out there where you can find pretty great salespeople, right? And that's the thing. You are looking for a salesperson. I've met a lot of um, folks, even clients of mine who had tried to just hire like some Filipino VA or like an Indian virtual assistant or whatever it may be. And right. they try to just like cram them into the appointment setting rule it usually doesn't work very well because it's such a different role. An appointment setter is more of a salesperson. They need to have good communication skills. Um, a VA, usually just like an order taker, and they're incapable of doing a lot of the sales tasks that a setter needs to do. So luckily, there's a lot of groups on Facebook where there's salespeople. Like it's literally just forums of salespeople congregating. Okay. There are probably like hundreds of those groups where each of them have thousands of either like experienced salespeople or people that want to get into sales, people who have been like following, you know, organic marketing strategies for a long time. You can essentially just post into those groups and have inbound requests for, hey, like here I am. This seems really interesting. Tell me a bit more about your role, right? So this is a little bit different than posting in a typical job board. There are a couple of job boards that I think are pretty good for remote workers. Um, but at the same time, I think there's such a high density of qualified talent on Facebook groups, which are specifically about sales, okay. that you're probably going to have a higher percentage chance of finding someone who has good sales skills in the digital marketing area um, uh, there instead of just trying to go to like Indeed or Monster or a typical recruiting board, right? Um, yeah. So th that's another avenue, right? Um, th another thing that we've actually tested before is running paid ads to get uh, applications. So if you're going to be running a paid ad, uh, I think it's best that you record a bit of a video as well. It's important to know that if you're trying to hire people, it's as much you trying to sell them on the experience as it is them trying to sell you on the experience. So if you can even record like a three to a five minute video explaining what the role is, why your opportunity is so great, why your company is so great, like that actually makes a huge difference. Something that we've found to be really, really good is hiring remote um, international setters and international salespeople because... Mm. There's so many people in South Africa or South America or Eastern Europe who are fluent in English, who mm -hmm. have been speaking English their entire lives. They have good sales skills. They've been studying people like Gary Vaynerchuk or whoever else it may be. 
but they live in countries where their cost of living is so dramatically lower than Canada or the UK or America that you can get essentially someone who is just as capable, maybe even harder working than an American, but at like a fourth of the, of the compensation rate. So like to give you an example, our setters right now are from uh, Paraguay, Serbia, and South Africa, and they're all fluent in English and very good at sales. Wow. And like all of them together are probably going to, you know, cost less than if I was just to hire like a single college kid from the States. Yet they're going to perform better. Yeah. And they're going to be just as happy, if not happier with what it is <laughs> that they make. So that's something mm-hmm. that I've found. And if you were to do the paid ads, it allows you to actually be hyper specific in where you target. Um, so that's really, really cool too. Um, those are a couple of things that we found work in, in the sourcing process. The hiring process is not super, super different. Although I will say like, I'm a big fan of doing role plays in my hiring process, because if they're a salesperson and we're testing them on how good they are in conversation, let's just see how good they are in conversation by putting them a little bit on the spot. An interview is a bit of a higher pressure situation. How do they perform? How well do they handle my objections that I give to them when I'm pretending to be a customer in our little role play, right? Like how good are they at that stuff? So I I found that that's always a very good indicator of the skill set. And then some uh, something else that I have found uh, really well um, that works really well in the hiring process is giving them a trial. Because as good as interviewing can be, sometimes someone who performs really well in an interview doesn't necessarily translate to how well they perform in the actual job. So (laughs) instead of just like giving them the role, I I tend to just say, Hey, like you two or you three are the finalists of the role of all the people that I've interviewed you, you two or three interviewed the best. So let's just give you each a week or two to be on the job to actually perform. And whoever does best is going to get the actual job. Right. So a little bit of competition to see how they react. Uh, But also let's actually test it out and see how they perform in the day to day. What's their work style like beyond just the conversation? Are they punctual to work? Are they coachable? So there's other things that sometimes you just can't really notice until you're spending a bit more time with them. So we do have that trialing process as well. And when you have this uh, all kind of lined up and you bring on proper talent and you kind of pair it with those standard operating procedures that I was talking about before, they're going to crush it. And that's what we've seen internally as well as our clients. Awesome. Awesome. We're, we're right up against it, Lloyd. This, this has been amazing, amazing, amazing content, my friend. This is amazing content. So I got, I got one last question for you. Actually, yeah. you know what? Let's, let's wrap this up the whole thing. So, Give us like a like a mini blueprint of how and doing. Then I have the last question for you. Give us about the like the the mini blueprint, like a one two three and how to get started with it, whether it be with you or someone else or or what have you. We're putting this together. Yeah. So the reality is everything that I just talked about is kind of hard to do. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, and there's only so much that I can share in half an hour uh, right. for someone to truly like install this type of system into their own business. So the first thing that I will say though is like get the foundations of your business right. If, if your offer doesn't have enough traffic coming in already, if you haven't solved um, either growing an audience organically or growing an audience with paid traffic, you probably need to start there first and don't even worry about the setting thing. Of course, organically, we're very good at that. Not only do we internally at Attract and Scale coach people how they can um, grow their appointment setting team, we also are very good at teaching people how you can grow just with organic, you know, uh, audience building, whether it be on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever it may be. So solve that, right? Um, Once you've solved that, if you then have so much traffic that you can't really manage it anymore, you don't feel like you're optimizing the traffic and really squeezing all the juice out of the lemon, so to speak. That's when you really want to start hiring setters. And like I had said, I think I lost you processes are set up properly and then you got to really make sure that you're hiring and onboarding and trading processes are really set up properly so those are the things that i would definitely do if i was in uh, you know in in a position of someone who is trying to scale their high ticket offer online um if if you want a bit more information on how this can actually all be done i do have a couple links um that i'm going to share with you in my show notes 
uh, in your show notes uh, to webinars and some other, uh, and actually my own Facebook group where they can join and they can get additional trainings. But on occasion, people are just going to be like, whoa, this is kind of complicated. I'd rather just work with someone who can help me install this. And that's where I think we would come in where we could give you a bit more of a one-on-one and uh, you know, in-depth support on how you can either grow your organic following or even install that appointment setting team that I've been talking about today. Sounds awesome, man. Sounds awesome. So I have one last question for you. Yeah. And th- this is, I think this is going to be in general because of your unique niche <laughs> of what you do. So I ask this of all of my guests and it goes something like this, that people who are watching now, they're, they have similar goals, some interests as you are, and they want to, you know, help people grow, I guess, their teams or grow, grow their businesses. So I'll say it in general. So can you tell them just in your own words, and I'll put you front and center, how they can become an authority in their, in their space? Yeah. So the way that I became an authority um, is, is I think I just gave most of my content out for free. Um, I mean, just doing that alone isn't enough, of course. Um, I, I think sometimes content creation can be a trap because... Uh, sometimes you don't even really get that content in front of people. That's, that's, that's for one, right? Like content creation by itself isn't enough, but if you are willing to create really, really great content that gives away a lot of information, if you're not afraid of, Oh, you know what? Like if I give all this stuff away, then what I'm going to be able to sell. Cause that's a a fear that I've heard a lot of people having. Like the reality is 90% of the things that I teach, I actually just provide for people. The reason why people join my programs is because we provide more in-depth support. We give accountability. We give like one-on-one coaching and feedback. We're able to help them actually learn about their unique and um, tailored methodology of applying the strategies that we share. So that's a lot more than just like the, the rote skills. If you're willing to give away the vast majority of information online away for free, that really goes a long way because then people can see more of your excellence. People can see more of your thought leadership. People can see more of your contribution. Um, And when you can combine that with actually knowing how to distribute your content, because that's the thing, what I was saying earlier is a lot of people share content, but then it doesn't actually get seen by anyone. So you got to also have a certain level of, of tactical skills. How do you actually make sure your content gets seen by the people um, how do you actually deliver your message? How do you actually get enough eyeballs on it? That's a bit more tactical, but at the same time, it's like when you have the willingness to create that content and you also have a little bit of tactical skill set to make sure that that content is seen by a lot of people, you can't eventually be seen as a thought leader, right? Yeah. So for me, that that was really what it was. I was willing to share a content and I knew how to make sure people could see it. Uh, <laughs> and then assuming people like my content, which... I mean, I would hope that's the case, (laughs) but assuming people liked it, then naturally they would resonate. Naturally they would follow. Naturally they would want to join my community. Naturally they'd want to reach out and. Yeah. I think I. And and I think from a lot of the people that I've spoken to, they've, they've shared a similar story. Um, So yeah. Awesome. Hopefully we that might, answer. We, yeah, that's, that's uh, you great. That's your standards. Yeah, that was definitely, definitely awesome. We might have you come back to tell us, you know, that that first part of how you did content and how you get that got uh-huh. you know, how, how you got that tactically out there, yeah. I, think I think that's a, a a burden for a lot of people that I I definitely know it's a problem for a lot of people out there. So a pain for sure. So, but tell people right now where they can find you after the show, where they should connect with you and, and learn more more about you and what your company does. For sure. So like I have a Facebook group of around five thousand people. So if people want to have like a good direct access to me, to my content, my Facebook group is linked in the show notes below. I have my, uh, my website at attract which actually contains just a ton more content about, uh, you know, us and also some free giveaways that you have. And we also have this cool little quiz, um, attract is my website. But if you type in slash organic, we've actually created a quiz for you. And this quiz pretty much will teach you how you, can optimize your existing business. Um, it teaches you kind of like your maturity stage of where you are in your growth. Um, are you still fairly early and you're still needing to maybe figure out content or figure out the basics of marketing? Or are you ready for something more intensive like a sales team, like an appointment setting team? 
it literally is the best option for lazy people who don't want to sit through a 30 minute webinar of mine because <laughs> you only need to answer four or five questions and it'll spit out like a legitimately custom report just for you based off of your answers. Awesome. So that's something that you can for sure consume as well. And regardless, we're super excited and super stoked to continue engaging with anyone here who's listening. Um, if you even want to just book a call with myself or my team, you can. The link has been given as well. So we're always open to having conversations with people and, um, and learning more. Awesome, man. That's, that's, that's great stuff. So glad to get you on here. I know we had to reschedule and get to get to to this week, but I'm glad we got you on here the, the following week. So just amazing, yeah. amazing stuff, man. That's this is totally, totally a, a very unique thing that, I, like you said, not, not, I haven't heard a lot about, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So, so hats off to you, man. And I hope everybody got a lot out of it. I know I did. People, as I as we wrap it up here, you know what I say all the time: build it, share it. And they will come. We'll see you next time. We're out of here. Peace. Peace. And that's a wrap for this episode of The Authority Project. Thanks so much for tuning in. And if you like what you heard, we want to hear from you. Subscribe, rate, and give an honest review. Share and tell your friends so they can hear too. And for even more authority building tactics, be sure to sign up at theauthorityletter.com. Get free weekly content and ongoing digital product giveaways to help you on your entrepreneurial journey. We certainly hope you got a key takeaway or maybe an aha moment from today's broadcast. Just remember, it's your authority. Build it, share it, and they will come. Until next time.